It's great to be here and to talk about two things. I'm going to then address two things. The first is, who's driving? The second is, missing the boat. Those are the only things I'm going to talk about in this conversation with you. And the first thing is then, who is driving? And it's a wonderful video. It's worked before. Am I driving? <laughs> that is the question that we're going to talk about, is who's driving <laughs> in this field? So those things that we need to be talking about who's driving relate to some of the efficiencies. So for the first piece of information about who is driving relates to an incredibly important study for all of us to think about, because it comes close to home comes from the Cleveland Clinic was a single center study about speed bumps. What they did was to say they were going to bring along a quality improvement program to identify operational inefficiencies, operational inefficiencies in diagnostic coronary angiography and in PCI and right heart catheterization and all the other things. And they then excluded emergency cases. And so in these operational inefficiencies, there were a whole bunch of things to consider. There were laboratory and institutional culture, there were nursing workflow, patient and physician arrival. There was the cath lab schedule, that notorious cath lab schedule. There was the central or decentralized schedule. There was prep and recovery area. There were procedural variables that we need to be driving on to make differences in getting where we want to go. And this is what their goals were for efficiency, productivity, the metrics and the goals. Their goal was, number one, to start every case at 745, or at least 85% of the cases. How many times do we then work in a laboratory where we'll say, we're going to have the patient on the table at 745, and about 815 people sort of uh, wander in. The second thing was to look at turnaround time. That drives people crazy. They wanted to have as a goal that the turnaround time between cases was 17 minutes. The third was that the percentage of open cath labs at maximum capacity would be 100%. And the fourth was lab productivity, to have it be stable or lower over the course of time. And so this is what they found in their very important study going from 2013 to 2016. There wasn't any significantly different it got a little bit shorter, but if you were to look at the turnaround time, that thing that caused us time and money, they went from 20 minutes down to 16.4 minutes. That doesn't mean very much, except over the course of a 12-hour day or a 15-hour day, that's a big deal. And so they were able to improve the efficiency in that regard. Did it matter to the people that worked in the lab, the people that run the labs for us? the paramedical people, it happened that when we asked them, they became engaged. They began to plan readiness action protocols. They began to more fully participate in studies. They then became part of the team and their overall satisfaction improved. Their conclusions were a systematic approach to reducing the inefficiencies can improve cath lab start times, turnaround times, overall productivity. And this can be helpful in assisting other cath labs in similar efficiency. You are driving. You should drive. The next piece of information is to say, we're going to talk about missing the boat. We are incredibly talented. You're incredibly talented. Everybody on this panel is incredibly talented doing the things that we do. Maybe the things that we do, we should expand to doing other things that we can do with the same equipment that we do it with now. And that's stroke. Number one cause of adult disability in the United States, 800,000 cases per year in the United States. If your laboratory is looking for a place of growth, if that's an unmet clinical need, 
This is it. Because time is brain. 30 to 40% of ischemic strokes are caused by large vessel occlusion. And we now have data on that. It's data from about a year and a half ago. There's now three additional pieces of information of randomized clinical trials of 1,200 patients with an acute ischemic stroke caused by occlusion of a proximal anterior artery circulation within 12 hours, randomized to either thrombectomy. We talked about it in the last case presentations, where you're going to use a specific kind of device to remove thrombus versus control therapy. The primary outcome was reduced disability at 90 days. Is that a big deal to be disabled at 90 days? You better believe it is. If you had just minor problems, you better believe that is a huge deal. And this is what they found in this meta-analysis. If you look on the right, it favored intervention. If you look on the left, it favored control. And everything favored intervention. The number needed to treat was 26 patients to improve disability rating at 90 days. In this pooled analysis of patient level data, we show that modern endovascular thrombectomy added to best medical therapy doubles the ads of a higher MRS score compared with best medical therapy. For every 100 patients treated, 38 will have less disabled outcome, and 20 more will achieve functional independence. That is an opportunity. That's an unmet need that we could meet because we get up at night. We know how to use catheters. The estimates are that there are only 600 stroke-ready neurointerventional cardiologists. There are more than 600 stroke-ready cardiologists at this meeting. There are 1,000 people that can figure out how to do that if they want to do that. And it's a huge volume. It's a huge opportunity. What are the requirements? You're going to need to know something about things, but you already know something about catheters. You're going to need hands-on experience. You're going to need to have acceptance as part of a multidisciplinary stroke team. We talk about heart teams. There are now heart-brain teams. You have to be in that space or the boat leaves without you. You have to be in that space or the boat leaves without it. You're going to need to have some work. You're going to need to have on round. Somebody's going to say, what indeed is this vessel, and are you going to be able to treat that with mechanical thrombectomy? And you're going to say, of course it can. I can get there. I've been there. I've been through the siphon. I've been to hell and back. Of course I can get there. Unfortunately, the next slide is going to say, well, it's actually a tree. It's actually a tree. And you better know which branch you're going to go to of the tree. And so there's cognitive pieces of information that we will have to learn, but we can do that. I think the future is very bright going forward. We have to be in the driver's seat of efficiencies, number one. Number two, we have to look at different areas to apply the amazing technology that we already apply in different spaces to make huge differences for the group of patients that now have cardiovascular disease. Not just coronary disease, it's cardiovascular disease. You are cardiovascular specialists, and all you're going to need is imagination. Get behind the wheel and drive it. Learn how to do other things with your skills and do it, because that is the future of our specialty as cardiovascular interventionists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for uh, for some discussion, and I do think we have four minutes. And um, I want to turn this over to Kirk. Kirk, uh, you just came off being president of our society, Society of Cardiac Angiography and Intervention. Where do you see, uh, you know, Dr. Holmes really puts out the opportunities for us as cardiovascular specialists to be more efficient, et cetera, but also to expand. And this whole field of acute stroke intervention is, is a place, it truly is an unmet need. Where do you see what our roles will be and how is the society getting involved in that? Thanks, Roxana. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the answer to the question is largely up to us. Uh, there are regulatory impediments and, and, uh, and the like. Uh, and uh, there are 
factors that will stand in the way if you go home today and say, that's it, I'm turning off the uh, coronary work, I'm done with structural, I want to do brain intervention. But I can tell you that the impediments before you are not insurmountable. Uh, the societies would have a very important role, I think, to play in negotiating settlements, if you will, to define how a cardiovascular practitioner can work in a neurointerventional space. But absolutely, there is a tremendous unmet need, and there is not a pipeline um, today that is poised to address that need in a reasonable timeline. I will say, though, that we have made progress. I can remember uh, uh, conversations around this very topic at um, the Grunzig meeting some years back, probably 10 years or more ago. And at that time, I remember hearing there were 150 neurointerventional specialists available in the country to meet the need. And now we're up to 600. So that's a big increase. Now it's taken a decade and a half, I suppose, to grow by that amount. And the numbers are still paltry relative to the demand. Um, and that response, I think, has come largely out of the neurointerventional community. What would it look like, then, if, if ACC and Sky uh, partnered uh, with, the, uh, with the neurologic societies to try to feed the machine, you know, drive change in a beneficial manner for folks with stroke. I, I, I so think it absolutely can happen. There's an important piece of information. You're going to say, I, I, I couldn't possibly figure out how to do that. For those of you that read Supplement 7 in the New England Journal about the CREST trial, in Supplement 7, there was um, core analysis of the cerebral, uh, of the carotid procedures done by cardiologists versus neurosurgeons versus neurointerventionists versus vascular um, interventionists. And it turns out that cardiologists did as well or better than any of the other fields. So we can manage that. We learned how to do carotid stinting. Once you get in carotid stinting and you're up there, navigating with the techniques that you know how to do around the siphon, you're, you're not talking about huge, tiny vessels. You're talking about an MCA. Um, you can figure out, you're going to learn where the MCA is. But this is technology that you have, that cardiologists have mastered in terms of doing stuff, uh, cerebral protection and all the things with the CREST trial. We learned how to do that. We can do that. It's a matter of doing the things that Kirk had said you know, that we have to do. I'd like to comment on our need, actually, to uh, have to be leaders uh, in the community. When we rolled out cath labs, we rolled out cath labs across the street from one another, not when they were, where they were needed. So when we have 150 go to 600 neurointerventionalists, you and I well know they're all you know, tripping over each other in long, the Longwood area in Boston, not actually where the strokes are occurring. And that's one, uh, one thing. In your start time stuff, uh, you know, I'm a cath lab director. I told people, I don't care when the first case starts. Because I know that pretty much it's going to start at 7.45, 8.15. But that's three or four or five opportunities uh, in the day for people to just fail. Because it's happened a number of times over the years. Some new cath lab director comes in, and they want to have start times at 7.45 instead of 8 o'clock and the interpreter doesn't show up and the INR is not back and a thousand things happening. But if actually everybody, if your job is actually to get everybody engaged, everybody can get engaged around an issue. And it doesn't actually have to be an issue that's meaningful. It can be an issue like you want to have turnover go from 20 minutes to 16 minutes. But that is meaningful because when you multiply across 20 cases, that makes much more difference than starting the day in one room at 8 o'clock instead of 8.15. So we actually, as leaders, have to push back when you know, a consultant company comes in and says, all right, start times is really what we're going to focus on. No, we're not going to focus on that because it's not that important. Very, very good. I, I think we can continue this discussion. It's this tremendous discussion. Um, not to mention, I'm just only going to say it, but for everyone to think about, uh, I, at the ACC Interventional Council that I chair, uh, we're actually putting together, and we're hoping to approach Sky to work on this with us, a, uh, a paper on 
the role of the cardiologist and our expanded role in taking care of acutely ill patients. And so now, if you add to this roster a stroke patient that we would intervene on, it would mean yet another groups of patients that we are responsible for. And we all know that as interventional cardiologists, we are the ones who are taking care of the evening, nights, overnights, and the responsibility of these patients. And yet, none of that is reflective of the, um, of the kind of respect or uh, uh, real understanding of what this means for the interventionalist. As I was sitting with Dwayne outside the room, his beeper went off and it was his acute MI beeper. And I said, well, I don't think you're gonna make it in time for that. But it is a lot on our plate already. But I totally agree that we would be great for this. And um, there's a lot of good discussion.